Ever since the agricultural revolution, the main direction of human history has been towards unity. The unification of humankind was driven forward by three main forces, money, empires, and religions. In the previous two lessons, we spoke about the role of money and of empires. In this lesson, we will focus on religion. I would like to offer you a very brief history of religion, focusing on the critical role that religions played in uniting humankind and the whole world into a single system. Today, religion is often considered to be a source of uh, disagreement, uh, disunion between people, even, dis uh, even discrimination. Yet, in fact, religion has had a vital role in bridging the gaps between different human groups. Since all social orders and hierarchies are imagined, they are very fragile. And the larger the society, the more fragile it, its order is. And the crucial historical role of religion was to give superhuman legitimacy to these fragile structures and thereby uh, stabilize them. Religions assert that our laws, the laws that govern our life in society, are not the product of some human caprice, but are ordained by an absolute and supreme authority. This helps place at least some fundamental laws of society beyond challenge, and this is what ensures social stability. Religion can therefore be defined as a system of human norms and values which is founded on a belief in a superhuman order. This definition, which we will use in this course, involves two distinct criteria that something must have in order to be considered a religion. The first criterion for religion is that religion must believe in a superhuman order which is not the product of human whims or human agreements. For example, if you ask, if you ask yourself, why is, why is it that professional football is not a religion? Even though professional football have many laws and rights and very often bizarre rituals and people have a lot of emotions involved in professional football, why isn't it a religion? It's not considered a religion because everybody knows, even the most devout fans of professional football knows, that human beings invented football themselves and FIFA, the World Association of Football, FIFA may at any moment decide to change the rules of football, for example, to enlarge the size of the goal or to cancel the offside rule. So because it's obvious that people invented it and can change the rule as they like, that there is no, uh, it's, not, it's not the result of some, of some superhuman order, then it's not a religion. Now the second criterion of a religion is that it not, not only believes in a superhuman order, it also establishes norms and values which are derived from the superhuman order and which are binding for people. If you believe in something superhuman, in some superhuman order, but you don't derive from that any norms and values, then it's not a religion. For example, if you believe in the theory of relativity, which is superhuman, because humans did not, cannot change the laws of the theory of relativity uh, just like that, because it's, it's not a human creation, but you don't derive any norms and values from the theory of relativity, then it's not a religion. It's simply something that you believe, and you may have very good reasons to believe in it, but as long as you don't try to base on it no, uh, the, the rules of behavior in society, then it's not a religion.
So a religion must believe in a superhuman order and must derive from these beliefs all kinds of rules and norms and values that uh, uh, organize human society. This is how religion gives legitimacy to the social order. Now, religion played a very crucial role in the unification of humankind because some religions argued that there is a set of norms and values which all people must follow, which are true everywhere, anytime, for everybody. And this is how religion helped create a universal order. But it should be clearly emphasized that not all religions made such universal claims. As far as we know, the majority of ancient religions were quite local and exclusive. They believed in all kinds of local deities and local spirits, and uh, they formulated norms and rules for behavior for the people living in this locality. But they had no ambition to convert the entire human race and to make people everywhere follow the same rules and norms and values. Universal and missionary religions, such as Buddhism and Christianity and Islam, they began to appear only in the first millennium BC, about 2,500 years ago. The emergence of such universal and missionary religions was one of the most important revolutions in history, and it made a vital contribution to the unification of humankind, much like the emergence of uh, universal empires and universal money. Prior to the emergence of these universal religions in the first millennium BC, most people in the world believed in all kinds of local animistic and polytheistic cults and, religion, and religions. What is, it, what, what is the meaning of these terms, animism and polytheism? Well, animism is the belief that the world is populated not only by humans, but also by an abundance of other beings, each of them having their own personality and needs and desires. For instance, animists may believe that trees and rocks they have needs and personalities and emotions, and if you do something, then the rock at the, uh, uh, on the hill next to your house may, became, may become angry and may punish you for it. Animists believe in all kinds of uh, uh, fairies and ghosts and demons and then things like that. So these are the things that animists believe. Uh, human norms and values, according to animists, they must take into consideration the interests and the outlook of this multitude of other beings in the world, not just when you come to decide how to run society, you have to take into consideration not only your own uh, interests and, and viewpoint, you must also take into consideration the rocks and the trees and the fairies and the demons and the ghosts and so forth. They, they are all part of the community. So this is animism. Now, polytheism also tends to believe in all these holy rocks and holy trees and uh, demons and fairies, but polytheists also believe, very importantly, in very powerful entities which are called gods. Polytheists believe that yes, there are all kinds of fairies and demons in the world, but at the end of the day, the world is governed, above all, by a collection of gods, very powerful entities, such as the rain god, the sea god, uh, the moon goddess, or the earth goddess. Now, 2,000 years of monotheistic brainwashing have caused most Westerners most people who believe in, in Christianity and Islam and Judaism to view polytheism as some kind of ignorant and childish idolatry, like praying to rocks and to all kinds of gods and goddesses. But this is a very unjust stereotype. 
Polytheism, in fact, has a very strong logic behind it. And in order to understand the inner logic of polytheism, it is necessary to grasp the central idea that led polytheists to believe in the existence of many gods, many different powers that rule the world. Polytheism does not necessarily dispute the existence of a single power or of a single law that governs the entire universe, including all the different gods. In fact, most polytheists and even most animist religions recognized the existence of such a supreme power or supreme law that stands behind all the different gods and demons and holy rocks. For example, in classical Greek polytheism, in the religion of the ancient Greeks, all the gods, the Zeus and Hera and Apollo and so forth, all the, all the different gods were subject to an omnipotent and all-encompassing power, which is the power that really rules the world, and this was called fate, Moira, or Ananke. All the gods, they are helpless in the face of fate. According to the polytheistic religion of, say, the Eurobas in West Africa, the Yoruba people in West Africa, there are many gods, yes, but all the gods were born of one supreme god called Olodumare, and Olodumare still is the uh, real ruler of the world. All the different gods, they remain completely subject to him. In Hinduism, in the Hindu polytheist religion, there is also a single principle called sometimes the Atman, which controls all the different gods and spirits and also humans and animals and plants and everything in the world. Atman is considered the eternal essence or the eternal soul of the whole universe as well as being the essence of the soul of every individual and every phenomena. Every individual, every tree, every rock is part of this Atman. So the, the idea that there is a single power or law governing the entire universe is not alien to polytheism. What is the fundamental insight of polytheism which distinguishes it from monotheism, from the belief in a single God like in Christianity or Islam, is that the supreme power governing the world, according to the polytheists, is devoid of interests is devoid, have no biases and interests, and therefore it is completely unconcerned with the mundane desires and cares and worries of human beings. It's pointless, according to polytheists, it's pointless to come to the supreme power of the universe and ask for his help in gaining victory in war, or ask for its help in gaining health, or causing rain to fall. Because from the all-encompassing vantage point of the supreme power of the universe, it makes absolutely no difference whether a particular kingdom wins or loses this war, whether a particular city prospers or collapses, whether a particular person lives or dies. From the viewpoint of the supreme power, it makes no difference. This is why the Greeks, even though they thought, they thought that fate is the supreme power of the universe and even the gods are helpless in the face of fate, the Greeks did not waste any sacrifices or prayers on fate because fate would not listen to you. Similarly, the Hindus, they did not, the Hindus built temples to almost anything you can, you can imagine. But Hindus did not build temples to Atman, the eternal supreme soul of the universe, because, you, be, because th this supreme power, it has no interests, it has no biases, so you can't make deals with it. You can't say, I'll sacrifice this or that, uh, pray to you in this prayer or that prayer, and in return, you will help me, because it won't help you. The only reason 
according to polytheistic religion, the only reason to approach the supreme power of the universe would be to renounce all desires and to embrace the bad things that happen in the world alongside the good things, to accept defeat, to accept poverty, to accept sickness, to accept death. For example, in Hinduism, there are some Hindus, the religious elite, known as sadhus or sannyasis. And these sadhus, they devote their lives to uniting with the Atman. They devote their lives to achieving enlightenment. Enlightenment, according to Hinduism, means to view the world from the viewpoint of this supreme fundamental principle and to realize that from its eternal perspective all the mundane desires and hopes and fears and ambitions of humans are completely meaningless and ephemeral phenomena. So these are the sadhus. But most Hindus, they are not sadhus. Most Hindus are very much interested and have been for thousands of years in all kinds of mundane ambitions and Atman is not going to help them achieve any of these ambitions. For assistance in such matters, like curing yourself from a disease or winning a lot of money in the lottery, you cannot approach the Atman. So for these purposes, the Hindus approach the different gods with their various partial powers. Now precisely because the, the powers are partial, not all-encompassing, gods such as Ganesha or Lakshmi or Sarasvati, they have interests and biases. And because of that, humans can approach them and make deals with them. They can rely on their help in order to win wars or win in the lottery, a lot of money, or recuperate from illness. This then is the fundamental insight of polytheistic religions like Hinduism. The supreme power of the universe has absolutely no interests and no biases. So if we want help with our mundane problems and ambitions, we must approach the partial and biased powers. And there are many, there are necessarily many such smaller powers. Because once you begin to divide the all-encompassing power of a supreme principle, you inevitably end up with more than one deity. Once you move from the supreme, uh, from the pinnacle of the pyramid, and you start dividing the power into all kinds of, of, uh, of uh, uh, less encompassing powers, then you get more than one. And this is why you have the, the Atman, and below the Atman, you have all kinds of different gods. And each, each time you may address a different god, which may, may or may not help you in your ambitions. One of the implications of this basic polytheistic insight is that polytheists tend to be tolerant towards the religious beliefs of other people. Since polytheists believe, on the one hand, in one supreme but completely disinterested power, and on the other hand, in many partial and biased powers, all these gods and goddesses, then polytheists have no difficulty to accept the existence and the efficacy of all kinds of gods. I may worship this god or this goddess, but there are others in the world. It, it's very obvious to polytheists. Polytheists is, are therefore inherently open-minded, and they rarely in history persecuted heretics or infidels. Because again, it's very easy for you to accept to recognize the existence of other gods and goddesses. I may not want to worship that god, but yes, somebody else might. Even when polytheists conquered huge empires, they almost never tried to convert their subjects, the conquered people, to their own religion. For example, when the Egyptians or when the Romans, or when the Aztecs, they conquered huge empires, they did not try to force all the people they controlled 
to convert to the Roman or to the Aztec uh, religion, and they also did not send missionaries to foreign lands beyond their control to convince people in other countries to accept our gods. The subject peoples in the empire were of course required to respect the gods of the empire and the rituals of the empire because this, this gave legitimacy to the empire and it was a sign of loyalty uh, to the empire. But the subject people were not required to give up their own gods and rituals. In many cases, the imperial elite actually adopted the gods and the rituals of the subject people. For example, Roman elites were very happy to add all kinds of Asian goddesses and Egyptian gods to their pantheon. And in the later Roman Empire, you find many Romans worshipping the Asiatic goddess Kible and the Egyptian goddess Isis. They were particularly um, uh, popular among the uh, Roman elites. The only god that for a very long time the Romans refused to tolerate was the monotheistic god of the Christians. The Roman Empire did not require the Christians to give up their beliefs and rituals, but it did expect the Christians to pay respect to the empire's protector gods and to the divinity of the emperor. The emperor in Rome was also considered a god. Now, this was simply seen as a declaration of political loyalty. When the Christian vehemently refused to accept the gods of the empire and the divinity of the emperor, and went on to reject all the different attempts to, to, to reach a compromise, it was only then that the Romans reacted by persecuting the Christians for what they understood to be political subversion. The Christians were not persecuted due to religious intolerance on the side of the Romans, but because the Romans considered the Christians' refusal to accept the divinity of the emperor and to acknowledge the protector gods of the, universe, of, the, of the empire, it was considered politically disloyal. This, this is why they were persecuted. And even this persecution of the Christians, it was done in a very half-hearted way by the Romans. In the 300 years that passed from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ up to the conversion of Emperor Constantine to Christianity, Polytheistic Roman emperors initiated no more than four general persecutions of Christians, which lasted a relatively short time. Local governors in all kinds of provinces, they incited some anti-Christian violence on, on their own in addition to these general persecutions. But still, if we combine all the victims of all these persecutions of Christians by the polytheistic Romans, it turns out that in three centuries the polytheistic Romans killed no more than a few thousand Christians. In contrast, over the course of the next 1,500 years, Christians slaughtered Christians in their millions to defend slightly different interpretations of the religion of love and compassion. The persecution of monotheist by monotheist was far, far more severe by several orders of magnitude than any persecution ever initiated by polytheistic religions. Why monotheists are far more fanatical than polytheists? And how come these, these fanatical monotheists came to dominate much of the world will be discussed in the next segment. <music>